At the age of 35, Ludwig van Beethoven had pulled himself back from the brink of suicide after realizing he was going deaf. He came through the trauma with characteristic defiance. He was already one of the most celebrated composers in Europe and now embarked on a period of prodigious creativity. I think the originality and diversity of the music he kept creating were a direct consequence of his battle against the physical odds. It's almost as if he felt he was running out of time to express what it was he knew he had to express. The biggest and most immediate challenge facing him was the writing of an opera, the summit of ambition for any composer at this time. Europe in the early 1800s was in chaos. Napoleon's forces were sweeping across the continent, recently occupying Beethoven's home city of Vienna. Although dismayed by this act of aggression, the revolution's ideals of freedom, truth and equality resonated with Beethoven, and within them he found inspiration for his opera, entitled Leonora. This is a work full of fiery revolutionary fervor and idealism, where freedom and justice triumph. It's a rescue story, and for the first time in operatic history, it's a woman, Leonora, who becomes the story's hero by rescuing her husband, Florestan, who lies imprisoned in a dungeon awaiting execution. And while the opera had been inspired by the revolution, it also fell victim to it. Yes, the occupation had dire consequences for the opera. Most of his friends and supporters had already left the city and the opening night audience was made up almost entirely of French officers. Unfortunately, it was only under half full. Not good for business. I wouldn't have missed the premiere of a new work by my great friend Ludwig. Also, as a patron, I had to be there. But even disregarding the small audiences, there were problems with the work itself. It was too sophisticated. <laughs> too long. And frankly, it needed more drama. After the performance, to encourage Ludwig, I gathered some cast together to sing it through and to try to persuade him to make some cuts. Beethoven blamed the difficulties of the opera entirely on the tenor who was playing the husband, Florestan. Personally, I thought this a little unfair, but I arranged for another to sing the part. Ah, Herr Hörkel, you've missed tea, but that may make you sing the part of a starving man all the better. <laughs> Let's start. Beethoven was prone to passionate outbursts, so I knew it would be a difficult evening. Floristan, Floristan. Excellent. I shall have to see to it that you are starved before every performance, and we shall be sure of a success. Hmm? You see, Litnovsky, every phrase is there for a reason. Yes, I agree. But that aria is not the problem. Making an opera is not like choosing which waistcoat to wear with a certain pair of breeches. It's uh, more complicated than that. 
Please try to understand. People want drama, not just clever music. The first two acts are just too long. They can't be shortened. Ludwig, please. For my sake, for your friend's sake, please don't let this beautiful work be lost to the world simply because it needs some refining. So you're all agreed then? Well, then I shall have to go back to the beginning. Take another look at it. However flawed the dramatic structure of Leonora was, musically you can see in it many Beethoven hallmarks. And in the aria which Leonora herself sings, he uses orchestral instruments for their symbolic effect. The horns, for instance, are used in a completely new way. Traditionally, they represent and accompany a male hero, but here they're reserved for Leonora. And on one level, they give her added power, but on another, the way that they're pushed and tested beyond their limits potently mirrors Leonora's own trials. <laughs> I suppose the shortened work was a reasonable success, but it made neither Beethoven nor my theatre a huge amount of money. It was so damn stubborn. Idealistic, you see. I don't think you could possibly have given me my right percentage. It's just Well, we can only pay you your agreed percentage. Ludwig, please, do count it again. I don't mean to count it again. I'm not stupid! You are only paid this very generous amount. <laughs> generous? <laughs> you are paid this very generous percentage because we all hold you in the highest esteem. But the fact remains, Ludwig, the house was under half full. Now, your music plays to a cultural audience, of course. Yes, it does. But, well, take the magic flute, for instance. Now, that really did rouse the multitude. I don't compose for the multitude. If we had paid Herr Mozart the same percentage of the receipts of his operas, well, he would have been a very rich man. What are you saying? Nothing. I... I think you should raise your Herr Mozart from the dead. Because the performances of this opera are finished. What do you mean? I mean what I said. Oh, now, Ludwig, please. Good day. Good God. Beethoven was true to his word and locked away the score of his opera. But he didn't forget it. In Leonora, he'd created the woman who perfectly embodied fidelity and womanhood. But in real life, she was much harder to find. Herr Beethoven had a great liking for female society. If ever he saw a charming face, we would often share a knowing look. He was always falling in love, usually with his piano students. But generally, the passion did not last long. And of course, often they were already spoken for. But that didn't stop him hoping. Finding a wife the perfect wife was very important to him. Oh, beloved Josefina, 
It is no desire for the opposite sex that draws me to you. No. It's just you. Your whole self with all your individual qualities. This has bound all my feelings, all my emotional power to you. One of the piano students Beethoven fell in love with was Countess Josefina Dem, a widow and mother of four. My parents arranged my betrothal to Count Dem. He died just before I had my fourth child. Beethoven often used to come to our house. And after I was on my own, we became very close. I can't deny it. I loved being with him. His music was so powerful. It could cheer me up or make me cry. And he was a kind man and good with my children. But as to anything more permanent, that was different. Beautiful love thing. Have you had a chance to think about my proposal? Do you not enjoy my company? You know I do. Do you not enjoy her lessons? Yes, of course. And I have the greatest respect and admiration for you. I see. Respect. Admiration. But not love. Yes. No. But... I have my position. My, my children to think of. How would we live? These things cost money. Oh, I, I understand. I do. Me, a mere musician. A musician who's going deaf. Countess Dem's refusal to marry dealt a crushing blow to Beethoven's hopes of finding love and marriage. Not only was his increasing deafness isolating him, but his uncertain financial status was also becoming an impediment to finding happiness. At the time of his great disappointment with Josefina Dem. His brother Karl seemed to find real happiness in love. But Beethoven could never accept Karl's choice. And he did like to see himself the arbiter in all questions of morality. Robert. True then. Yes. We are to be married. Well, with all your distractions, I actually need to find someone else to look after my affairs. No, I can still work. Johanna is expecting our first child, so I need. Out of wedlock. A splendid work, brother. That's just splendid and true to form. And as for you, lady, I know you. And so does all Vienna. Oh, yes, that's right. Nothing is ever good enough for the high and mighty Beethoven. 
Or is it that you can't bear to see somebody else being happy? Get out. Well, I knew him to be an unpredictable man. It is said men with great gifts have little time for pleasantries, but what had I done to deserve such harshness? And treating Carl, his brother, like an enemy. <sighs> Perhaps I was not as fine a lady as the great composer was used to sharing company with. He made my head spin with his insinuations. Beethoven was intolerant of those who didn't live up to his own high moral standards. Unable to reconcile real people, real desires, with his own idealized vision of women. Quite a beauty, isn't she? Misunderstood and frustrated, Beethoven consistently felt isolated from those around him. At exactly this time, there's a typical example of how, consciously or subconsciously, the tensions in his life found expression and release in his music. He was writing a new piano sonata, which became known as the Appassionata. Its title tells you everything. This is music of violent rage, tragedy, and despair. This sonata finds Beethoven in the depths of human suffering. The passion and turmoil caused by his failed love affair with Josefina and his ambivalent feelings towards his brother's happiness are woven into the very fabric of this music, which starts darkly at the lower register of the keyboard. Now, like in so much Beethoven, this theme is built around a broken chord. This is a chord. Here it is, broken. Then, after this darkness, you get a moment of poignant respite, an acknowledgement, perhaps, of his inexorable spirit. He's bruised, but he's not beaten. From there, he cranks it up a notch, up a semitone, raising the tension. Now he explores that fragment. Recognize that, the fifth symphony motif, which crops up again and again throughout Beethoven's compositions. Darkness, misery, introspection, but determination. Beethoven's saying with this piece, I'm still here. This is my inner core, and I'm not ashamed to show it to you. And the tension between this despair and his innate musical strength light a touch paper so that the piece suddenly explodes. <laughs> The mood he creates of sheer desperation and determination is imprinted on every bar of this first movement. The Appassionata was created in stormy political times. Austria was still under French occupation. Despite the political uncertainty, Beethoven's reputation was growing and wealthy patrons gravitated to him because of his increasing celebrity. 
In Prince Lichnowsky, he thought he'd found someone who understood his uncompromising artistic vision. The whole region was in chaos. There were troops everywhere. One had to make one's life as comfortable as possible. And if that meant spending the odd evening entertaining some French officers, then that's what one did. Some of them were actually very cultured and even loved music. Obviously, they were very interested to hear of my support of my great friend. Ah, Ludwig! Come in! Oh, come and join us! I'd like you to meet my friends. We never stop moving. You never know the next time you'll feel clean sheets or a comfortable bed. And that is until we stay here. Gentlemen, I propose a toast to our host. To our host. Thank you. Well, I hope I can make your stay all the better by persuading our guest of honor, Herr Ludwig van Beethoven, to play for us. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm very tired. I better go to bed. It's early. I have a very busy day tomorrow. I have a lot to do. Herr Beethoven, please. You would honor us with your playing. Play! 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 I'm not performing seal! He may not be a performing seal, but he's certainly a Rhineland pig. Perhaps we should arrest him, gentlemen. <laughs> I doubt if any of you swine would know what a piano keyboard looked like if it was blown to from the end of a cannon. I will not play for you! Nor will I play for your emperor. Napoleon. Can't your guest take a joke? Such is the nature of the artistic mind, gentlemen. If you'll excuse me. What are you doing? Where are you going at this time of night? Ludwig, please! There are, and there always will be, thousands of princes. But there's only one! Beethoven! What about your new work? The manuscript will be ruined. To this day, the rain streaks from that night can still be seen on the Appassionato manuscript. Sir? Sir? This note arrived for you. Dear Ludwig, I wanted you to know I have great news. Johanna has given me a beautiful son, Karl. A boy. It's a new Beethoven. Hmm? I hope you will visit and see your nephew soon. Beethoven refused to see his newborn nephew. 
Once again, his impossibly high and unrealistic moral standards short-circuited his natural feelings. For him, Johanna was simply not a good enough mother for the Beethoven family, and therefore he couldn't visit them. In fact, he didn't see his new nephew for eight years. In the meantime, I think, he found an emotional substitute in his relationship with the teenage Archduke Rudolf, who was himself a talented musician, and who became his new patron. Ludwig? Ludwig? Yeah? I've been wanting to ask for some time. I'm intrigued by your methods. Please do not think me rude, but with your hearing difficulties, how do you compose? I'm sorry, that was out of place. That's the... I know there's much curiosity about me. Much tittle-tattle. Huh? It's true, many of the high notes are lost to me. And sometimes more. Both good days and bad days. And it doesn't affect me, though, as you might think. You see, all of the music that I write, I can hear. In my mind. Hmm? I know the sounds that every instrument can make. I can hear them all, in a trio, quartet, orchestra, it's, it's all there, it's all there. In my head. One of the pieces that Beethoven was working on during this time was his pastoral symphony, music which does, I think, express his deepest sense of loss for the sounds of nature that he'd soon not be able to hear. The countryside, for so many 19th century composers a source of inspiration, was for Beethoven a place where man could encounter God. Although large public orchestral concerts were rare in the early 19th century, Beethoven's fame secured him a night in Vienna's most popular theatre just before Christmas 1808. Even today, this concert seems like an extraordinary event. Just imagine being present at the public premiere of five major Beethoven works, including the Fifth Symphony, Pastoral Symphony, the Fourth Piano Concerto, some of the most famous music in history. For Beethoven, the concert was an important personal statement. He was saying, just look at what I'm capable of. And the whole of Vienna wanted to see how he had refined his gift. And of course, they wanted to see the famous Beethoven himself. Well, he realized that this concert was very important for his reputation and for his financial situation as well. Beethoven decided to start the concert with the Pastoral Symphony. It was his way of easing the audience into an evening which would become increasingly challenging. Challenging not just for the concertgoer, but for the orchestra as well. With just one rehearsal for the musicians to learn the music, the tension before the concert was palpable. Stop! Stop! What's wrong? What's the matter? What markings have you got to? Why have you stopped? Really sick for you, too. Come on. I know it's early. Again. Well, he didn't make it easier for himself or others. Beethoven's conducting style was so wild and hard to follow, and he was so demanding that eventually the orchestra refused to play if he was present. 
It was left to the unfortunate Rhys to act as go-between. Sir, they say there is too much. There is so much new work, uh, and it is too difficult. Beethoven, you know we only have one rehearsal, and the orchestra are merely human. Just tell them to play it exactly as I have written it. The orchestra eventually got through the enormous repertoire planned for the concert, and on a freezing cold December evening, hundreds of people flocked to an unheated Viennese theatre to see and hear the city's most famous resident. After the evocative lyricism of the Pastoral Symphony, Beethoven assaulted his audience with the violent Fifth Symphony, a kind of electric shock therapy. Starting with those four powerful notes, the Fifth Symphony is really an exercise in compression, in stark contrast to the Sixth Symphony, the Pastoral, which takes the same opening rhythmic fragment and expands it. It's interesting to look at these two symphonies side by side, and that's how Beethoven saw them very much as a pair. And where the Sixth Symphony is lyrical and expansive, the Fifth Symphony is brutal and compact and lacking in any obvious melody. And unlike any symphony that had gone before, the whole piece is one through line towards the exultant finale. Beethoven uses a variety of musical devices to bring about this tremendous sense of climax, but none more so than the use of that opening rhythmic device. It's everywhere, and in fact it pervades his entire compositional output. Near the end of the third movement, the scherzo, Beethoven strips the music right back, the timpani just keeping that rhythmic cell ticking away. And it's out of this sparse sound world that the fourth movement erupts, pushing decibel levels to new heights. You hear piccolo and trombones for the first time in a symphony, and the whole orchestra explodes in this climactic finale, where Beethoven is taking us from minor to major, from darkness to a blaze of light.
Beethoven also used this concert to demonstrate his complete mastery of keyboard composition. The fourth piano concerto signalled a startling new era for the role of the piano in a concerto. Invariably, the orchestra would lead before creating space for the piano, but Beethoven turns this on its head, starting with a solo piano. And not only that, he starts tentatively, almost in the manner of an improvisation. It's a very introverted beginning, the antithesis of the grand gesture. Fifth Symphony, Fourth Piano Concerto, invariably it's somewhere close. With this strange beginning, Beethoven is starting a conversation or even a set of negotiations where the piano is attempting to dictate terms to the orchestra. The tension between the two is there right from the start. The orchestra come in in a key which is completely foreign to the piano. So much of the time, this is conversation through discord. The tension becomes much more pronounced in the second movement where the orchestra and the soloists are determined not to engage with each other. They're almost in gridlock, two utterly alien musics at work. When the piano finally breaks out, it does so in a very unusual way, sounding almost unlike anything which has gone before. And now the gulf between soloist and orchestra seems almost unbridgeable. You might expect the orchestra to just stand up and leave the room. Eventually, though, Beethoven brings about resolution and reconciliation. The piano and the orchestra unite to allow for the catharsis of the last movement. The piano has mollified the orchestra. The individual voice has soothed the masses. And Beethoven's violent instincts have been tempered by his compassionate will. It's a very accurate self-portrait in music.
success of this epic concert confirmed Beethoven's position as Vienna's, and indeed Europe's, most celebrated composer. But his financial situation was precarious. The concert didn't make Ludwig the money he wanted, and even deserved. And an offer had come through for a job working away from Vienna. So he soon let all his patrons, including me, know that he might desert us. Of course, we had to do something. You must understand I need total artistic freedom. Yes, it's all fine, Ludwig. I need to travel whenever I want and have benefit concerts when I need them. It's all in the annuity contract. All we ask is that you agree to continue to live in Vienna. This was an extraordinary and unique agreement, the first time an artist had been recognized in this way. Beethoven was to be paid a lifelong yearly sum to compose whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted. At around this time, with his money worries seemingly at an end, Beethoven entered into a passionate relationship with a woman he called in an extraordinary letter, his immortal beloved. Her real identity has been the subject of debate for the past 150 years. And while we may never know for certain, the most recent research seems to indicate that she was Antoni Brentano, the wife of a merchant. Beethoven had a close relationship with the couple. My angel, my all, my very self, much as you love me, I love you more. I can only live either wholly with you or not at all. No one else can ever possess my heart. Never, never. Your love makes me at once the happiest and the unhappiest of men. Continue to love me. Never misjudge the most faithful heart of your beloved. Forever yours, forever mine, forever us, Ludwig. I was ill because I didn't want to leave Vienna. My husband's work meant that we had to go and live in Frankfurt and I, I just couldn't bear it. How is she today? No, I'm better, I'm afraid. It's good of you to come. Should I play something for her? Yes, please. I'm sure it would help. It always does. Now, if you'll excuse me, I, I'll go back to the office. There is still a lot of work to do before we leave. Thank you, my friend. me. His music told me everything about his feelings for me and I would have given up everything for him. We loved each other deeply but he loved my husband as well and I just don't think he felt able to cause so much pain to a friend. I would have gone with him. But Ludwig... Well... Perhaps when it came to it, the, the idea of a married life was, was something best kept as a dream. 
Because his music would always come first. I may no longer be a man, not for myself, only for others. For there is no longer happiness except in my music. Beethoven was devastated by the breakup of the affair. It put an end to the illusion that he could ever find a normal family life. And I don't think it's a coincidence that at this time his hearing began to deteriorate more rapidly. Added to this, the money from his special contract with his aristocratic patrons had stopped. The effect of crippling inflation under the rule of France meant his backers couldn't keep up their annuity payments. I went to his lodgings to see how he was. He wasn't at home. But what I found shocked me. Everything just seemed to go wrong at once. He seemed broken, so unhappy, and suddenly extremely hard of hearing. Although that may only have seemed worse, due to the malaise that now engulfed him. He sent me a letter in which he seemed to be in a bad way. By then we had not seen each other since our argument. A number of unfortunate incidents which have occurred one after the other have really driven me into a state bordering on mental confusion. He complains of a thoroughly lacerated heart. By all accounts, he had become so neglectful of his person as to appear positively dirty. Are you sick? Yeah. What's wrong with your father? Hmm? Tell me. Well, speak up! Hmm? I'm your uncle. Yeah, uncle Ludwig. What is it? What is it? Come, come. Is this A chance meeting with his brother Carl, now ill with tuberculosis, gave Beethoven the opportunity to claw back his family in the most extreme and desperate way. I must speak plainly. The reason you are in trouble is that Johanna has none of the qualities that make a good wife. None. I will look after little Carl, but you must make me the sole guardian. Hmm? Hmm? She's his mother. Yes, 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 yes. And so she shall remain. But this... This document will give me certain rights, you see to look after your interests, you, the father, the Van Beethovens. Hmm? So, here, Carl. Read. Now, 
No, saying you can't. You can't. That's right. Much as I am convinced of the open-hearted disposition of my brother Ludwig mm -hmm. van Beethoven, I desire that after my death he undertake the guardianship of my surviving minor son, Karl von Beethoven. I do not know what drives a man to want to separate a child from his mother. I can only think that he wanted a family of his own, so mine was the obvious choice. Pushing my weakened husband, who so close to death could not stop him, was beyond worldly explanation. Beethoven's behaviour seems incredible to us now, but he genuinely believed he was protecting his family from a woman who he saw as a completely unsuitable mother. And by a bizarre twist of fate, his belief in his own rectitude and his sense of his standing as an artist were about to receive the most colossal boost. His freedom opera, Leonora, was chosen to be performed before the crowned heads who were assembled for the Congress of Vienna, which redrew the map of Europe after Napoleon's downfall. Retitled Fidelio, some of the most dramatic changes to the work were in Florestan's aria. He places extra emphasis on the word Freiheit, or freedom, in an incredibly high-pitched conclusion that's almost impossible to sing at the very limits of a tenor's range, forcing him, like Florestan, into a state of exhaustion and physical breakdown. This time, the opera was a success. Its universal themes of triumph over adversity and hope over despair were embraced by audiences yearning for peace after the turmoil of the Napoleonic Wars. Professionally, Beethoven could do no wrong. Fidelio had made him the most sought-after composer in Europe, but privately, his life was unravelling. His brother's illness and his worsening hearing were conspiring against him. Good evening. Welcome. Please, sir. I remember the performance of the trio he had written for me. I was so looking forward to it. In certain passages, my dear friend pounded on the keys until the strings jangled. And in others, he played so softly that whole groups of notes were omitted, so that the music became unintelligible. Please sign this, Carl, for our son. Give me your hand.
It is a great misfortune for anyone to be deaf. But how shall a musician endure it without giving way to despair? I have found it necessary to add to my will that I by no means desire that my son be taken away from his mother, but that he shall always remain with her. To which end the guardianship of him is to be exercised by her as well as my brother. God permit them to be harmonious for the sake of my child's welfare. Humiliated, Beethoven never performed in public again. This is the last wish of the dying husband and brother, Carl van Beethoven. With his brother's death, Beethoven's incredibly productive and innovative heroic period was over. The next decade would be dominated by a bitter custody battle with Johanna for his nephew Carl, and a slow and agonizing descent into near total deafness. But once again, he would find a triumphantly defiant musical response by composing works so radical that even to our sophisticated and knowing ears, they still have the power to amaze. And you can hear the whole of the Piano Concerto No. 4 as it would have sounded at its premiere with Beethoven uncovered on BBC Four now. <laughs>